Welcome everyone who's joined us thus far. Just a quick note that we will get started at approximately 2.05 p.m. Eastern, 11.05, 11.05 a.m. Pacific time. Uh, so if you just, uh, we'll wait for everyone to join the line and then uh, we'll get underway. Thank you. Okay, it's uh, 2.05 Eastern time where I'm located uh, in Ontario. And uh, good afternoon or good morning, no matter where you're joining us and uh, welcome to today's session. So first off, thank you very much for joining us uh, for today's Inside KNWNT webinar session, which is the fifth and final session in this series, uh, which has provided an inside look at Canada Soccer's women's national team program uh, over the past couple of months. We certainly uh, hope that everyone is staying well and staying safe wherever you are, uh, tuning in from across Canada or around the world. Uh, my name is Dominic Martin, a Director of Marketing at Canada Soccer, and it's my sincere pleasure, as always, to provide a quick intro and some housekeeping details before we get started. Uh, as many of you will have heard us mention already, uh, the webinar series that you're participating in today was developed and launched as part of uh, the Canada Soccer Nation Inside Initiative, which was put together to support the Canadian soccer community during the COVID-19 pandemic. For more information on available resources and programming uh, connected to this initiative, we invite you to visit canasoccer.com where you will also find links to the uh, previous uh, editions of those webinar series uh, for on-demand viewing. Continuing as your hosts with the most for the Inside Can WNT webinar series, our former women's national team legends, Rian Wilkinson, currently Canada's women's national team assistant coach, as well as youth national team coach. And Robin Gale, currently Canada Soccer's Excel mental and cultural manager. We do have a fantastic lineup of athletes from Canada's women's national team set to participate during today's Players Lounge Hangout. Uh, and I'll wait for Rian and Robin to provide detailed introductions for each of them shortly. As a quick refresher on the Q&A format, we do encourage you to submit questions throughout the webinar using the Q&A tool in Zoom questions will be selected to be answered throughout the discussion uh, and we'll do our best as always to get through as many as possible time permitting. We do thank you to thank uh, extend a thank you to those who have submitted questions in advance. Uh, those will certainly be included in today's discussion. 
uh, to optimize your experience during the Zoom session, we do recommend that you select side-by-side -side view or gallery view if this is available to you. And this will ensure you can see all of our panelists as well as the shared content throughout the webinar. Uh, again, as we always mention, we are working with technology uh, and for ever, whatever reason we may lose connectivity during the webinar, we would encourage you to stay inside the Zoom environment and we'll do our best to relaunch and reconnect as quickly as possible. Fingers crossed we won't have any issues today. Okay, that's it for the final time. I'll now turn it over to Reen and Robin to get things underway. Thank you everyone and enjoy. Thanks, Tom. Hi, everyone. Happy belated Canada Day to you all. And thank you for joining Reen and I today for our last episode of Inside Canada UNT. We kicked off this series eight weeks ago to give you an inside look into our players, our staff, and our women's national team program. So hopefully you've learned a little bit more about what happens behind the scenes, the pathway to the women's national team, and something new about some of our awesome players. We've structured today a little bit differently from our previous webinars. Um, so we've used all the questions that have come from you, the fans, players, coaches, through social media, emails, and of course, as Dom mentioned, you'll have the opportunity to send questions through in the chat today. So we've broken this seminar into three main themes. We'll start with the player's journey to the national team, hear about their experiences from grassroots, recs, university to going pro, then we'll get into what it's actually like to be a member of the women's national team and learn about some of their favorite memories representing Canada. Then we'll finish with some insight and advice from the players on 2020 and beyond. So please send your questions through in the chat and we hope you enjoy this last inside look into Canada WNT. Thanks Robin, thank you all for joining us today. I get the, the pleasure of introducing you to our four players that are with us today. Uh, first, I'd like to introduce you to Erin McLeod, who first joined the team in 2002 and uh, currently plays for the Orlando Pride. So she is joining us today from quarantine down in Orlando. Thanks for, <laughs> for being here, Erin. We also have Miss Deanne Rose, who joined the team in 2015. She is currently playing for the Florida Gators down in Gainesville. So thanks for being here. And uh, we have Jesse Fleming, who first joined the team in 2014, according to Wikipedia. Sorry if uh, that was wrong, Jesse. She plays for UCLA Bruins and is joining us today from her hometown of London, Ontario. And finally, we have Jordan Heidema, uh, who joined the team in 2017 and currently plays for PSG in Paris, France, where she's joining us today. So a big welcome to the four of you and thank you so much for making the time to do this. So we're going to jump right in because uh, we got so many questions and you can see they're, they're continuing to come in. And we're going to kick this off with the journey part of everything. And my first question is going straight to Erin. So can you tell us a little bit about your journey, where you started playing and how you ended up playing for the Canadian national team? And you're welcome for the picture. Yeah, I was going to say this is unbelievable. It's just something <laughs> you can't run from in the past. Um, yeah, so my journey, I, let's keep in mind, I'm 37 years old. So my journey, the journey that is happening right now for a lot of these players is quite different. But um, yeah, for me personally, I, I started playing, I think, you know, for my city team, I was in Calgary and I was like 13 years old when I made that team as a midfielder. That's right. Um, and then uh, I kind of jumped into goal quickly after that. So I was playing for the provincial team. Uh, I was always playing up in age group and I was 18, 19 years old when I started playing for Ian Bridge uh, for the under 19 women's national team. Um, and from there it was, you know, we played that um, incredible tournament uh, at home in front of like a sold out crowd at our last game, which was pretty incredible. And um, quickly after that, I started getting invited into the, the full team. So I was kind of like, you know, like the cookie cutter, you go from this team to this team to this team. But um, I had, uh, yeah, a lot of help along the way. And of course, uh, my dad being one of my first coaches. Um, and I just feel really lucky that I am, I am this old and still playing the game that I love. That's awesome. I didn't know you were a midfielder. That's, that's yeah. I was also the star of my high school team in Jakarta at the Jakarta International uh, School as a midfielder. Thank you very much. Good to know. Yeah, I love how you skipped over that you, uh, you grew up in Jakarta for part of your, that's just the minor. Yes, also <laughs> random fact. Yes, two years. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so Deanne, I am, you know, slightly younger than Aaron. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your journey, what it was like joining the national team when you were so, so young. Um, of course, you're so old now. And uh, whether you had a favorite female athlete that inspired you and motivated you to, to push uh, to get you to the senior team at a very young age. Um, I think for me, I always looked up to the older players on the national team, like Desiree Scott, Christine Sinclair, some of the, um, the veterans now. And then um, I also always looked up to Serena Williams as an athlete. Like, I just thought she was such like a powerful athlete and woman and, and such a good role model. So I always looked up to her and yeah. Thanks, Deanne. Well, Reen and I both noticed that you didn't mention our names there, but that's okay. <laughs> We're going to get into some of the development phases for you guys. So all of you have had to leave the comfort of your hometowns when you were quite young to support the development, um, your development as players. So Jordi, we'll start with you. Um, what was it like being a part of the rec system? And can you talk about what it was like to leave your family in Chilliwack and move to Vancouver to train? Yeah, so... Um... I started obviously in Chilliwack when I was pretty young, um, but we didn't have the teams that I needed to be on in order to move and progress up the system. So I eventually found myself moving out to Surrey, um, just making the trek in and out from Chilliwack. Um, when I was about 12, I left from playing there to playing for the Whitecaps. At that point, we didn't really have a Rex. It was just kind of Whitecaps. Um, and then I think I was 14 or 15 when I, officially made my move to Vancouver to live with a billet family and a roommate at that time. Um, but I don't regret it at all. Like I loved it and I loved every second of it. I feel like it made me independent at such a young age and uh, I love the program and I love the players and the staff and uh, just to be surrounded with them every day at school and then go and train. It was, it was honestly ideal. And yeah, I really loved it. Thanks Jordy. Well, for many of the players, right now that may be tuning in, their next step may be looking to continue playing at the collegiate level. Um, so we all know that can be a tricky process to figure out what school you go to. Jess, could you tell us how you decided to, to attend UCLA and what advice would you have for players who are looking to make that decision right now? For sure. Um, yeah, I, I think for me, I remember when I was first trying to decide uh, which school I wanted to go to, um, my parents had drawn like a five hour radius from our house because uh, they wanted me to stay close to home. Um, but once I was able to kind of go out to UCLA and see the campus and kind of learn more about the school there, um, I think it was a good all around fit for me. Um, academics are really important. So it's something I put a lot of weight on when I was making my decision. Um, and then I also just wanted to be in an environment where I felt like I wasn't necessarily going to be the best player on the field. So I think where I was challenged and um, yeah, I, I think just a positive environment that uh, kind of played the, the style of soccer I wanted to play. Um, and I mean, looking back, I'm, I'm extremely happy with my decision. I, I had a great four years there. So, um, but yeah, I, I think I just put a lot of thought into the all around picture, not just, uh, not just soccer. Yeah, well, that's a great point. And as we've talked through our webinars, that whole holistic approach is something that's really vital for us in the national program. It's something really that all players should be looking to replicate through all stages of their development. But now we'll just shift a bit to Jordi because you decided to forego university and move straight to France to play professionally for PSG, which is really amazing. Um, and you're definitely the first Canadian women's national team female player to do this. So. Can you tell us now a little bit about how and why you chose to make that decision? Yeah, um, I'm pretty similar to Jesse. I mean, for me, school is really, really important. So that's what made the decision so difficult. Um, it was just kind of, that was the ultimate choice was, do I take my path professionally or do I want to go, go to school now and get my education now? Um, at the end of the day, um, I just figured that this would be the best path for me soccer wise and professional wise. Um, and then I could balance with school while I was here. So starting to take a few courses online and then seeing if I could do it while I'm here. Um, and then I always thought, okay, after I'm done playing the sport I love, I can always go back and do it. Um, so I just wanted to get as many years as I could at the highest level. Um, and yeah, obviously, I mean, I've said it a million times. I like wanted to 
show that there's more directions that you can take than just going to college or following the the path that's been set. So I wanted to kind of show kids like growing up that, yeah, you can take another step and you can go a different way. And that's okay too. Both ways are amazing and you'll develop so well, but yeah, I just wanted to show that there's multiple paths that you can take. Well, a little bit of a follow-up question, Jordy, but you um, obviously you've gone to France. This is a, uh, a culture shock. There's another language there. I know it wasn't easy. I think you're talking now about making that decision and that was a hard one, but can you talk a little bit about how you take these big leaps and they're hard, like they're not easy straight away and you have to work through it. Cause I don't think we talk enough about that, that these are, these are tough things to do. Yeah. I mean, I feel like there's a lot of hidden variables that you don't really see right away. You're kind of caught in the lust of, Oh, going to play overseas with a professional club. Um, I think for me, the biggest change and the, the biggest difficulty was just being so far away from family and friends, um, learning to kind of talk through a screen or trying to find that kind of, I don't know, that connection in a way with your family still, but not seeing them for six or seven months at a time. And then when you're back, you're trying to balance seeing your friends you haven't seen and seeing your family. And I think a big difficulty too is like, you come and at first you you're kind of obviously you're missing your family missing home um and then you get into the flow and the rhythm of being a professional athlete and you kind of start to forget about those things or the the feelings kind of pass um and then you get to see them again and it's just a rush of emotions and then you leave because you only get a few days or maybe a week or so um and then the the emotions come of did i spend enough time with them was my you know, was I fully invested with them when I was there in the moment? Uh, was I spending too much time with friends and not enough time with family or vice versa? So you start really overthinking like how you spent your time. Um, but I feel like at the end of the day, all the goods outweigh the bads in a way or not the bads, but the difficulties. Um, but yeah, there obviously is difficult or more difficult parts or aspects of being a professional footballer that not a lot of people see. Uh, thanks. Thanks for your honesty on that. I do think it's important. It's it's easy to look at people's social media and all the good things, and there are so many, but there are challenges as well. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm going to throw this to, to Jesse now. So when you look back at your youth soccer um, and the development that you experienced going through it, can you can you actually pinpoint what it was that helped you get to the national team, whether it was a coach, whether it was something with a system that helped you, but what was it that allowed you to go from London, Ontario to playing to, for Canada? Um, it's a tough question. Yeah. Um, I, th I think it's hard to pinpoint one thing. I mean, I definitely had um, obviously a lot of good people around me. Um, so I think with the under 17 team, um, I really enjoyed working with Bev. Um, we had Candace Chapman with us. Um, so I think kind of being able to interact with former players and, and people who are fairly experienced in the game um, and kind of listening to the advice they had and um, I guess being able to be pushed like by people like that. Um, I also played underaged a little bit uh, in the youth system. So I think having to play with players who are a bit bigger than me, faster than me, um, I think that definitely helped and challenged me um, and kind of tested my game. I mean, I'm still, I'm definitely not the biggest player on the field. So I think having to adapt and, and learn how to play when uh, physicality isn't necessarily my strength. Um, I think that that helped a big part of my game. Um, and then, yeah, I also think just having a solid support system of, of friends and family to kind of always lean back on. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I can't say enough about, you know, all the positivity and um, just the people I had around me, really. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty lucky to have the network I had. So um, I heard a few things there, but really cool to have you sort of had a mentor within the youth environment in a Candace Chapman or a Chappie Senior, as we call her, but as well as the support network to keep pushing you. And I guess what you didn't speak to is the attitude to, to be challenged against bigger, faster players and want to, instead of being frustrated by it, rising to the challenge. So that's, that's awesome. Um, you did mention Chappie Senior, someone who uh, played with her for many years, Erin. 
Um, you know, again, like I was talking to Jordan about, there are setbacks. And uh, when you're a Canadian, a young Canadian watching Olympics and World Cups and, and games on TV, you see the glamour or you see the, the, the awesome part of it, but you maybe don't hear or see about the challenges. So maybe you can speak to a time where maybe you didn't make a team or you suffered a setback and how you overcame that difficulty. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I've had um, quite a few setbacks in my career. And um, I think, um, yeah, I think one that was really challenging for me and kind of reshaped my career was in 2008, uh, the Olympics, I tore my ACL that tournament. And, um, you know, everyone kind of asked if I was just like, devastated and mortified by this injury. But um, at that point, I remember being relieved because um, I became so stressed and anxious going into games. And I had such a like fixed mindset about making mistakes. And, um, you know, I took, I really took it so hard. And this game that I just loved so much for so long, uh, I learned to, I just had this like inner battle, like love and hate relationship. And um, so when I uh, tore my ACL, I was relieved, but it kind of, I was able to step back and think like, I work so hard. I'm at the top of the game and like, and I'm not even enjoying it. And so for me, that was kind of the first time where I started like evaluating, you know, like how can I start approaching the game differently? What do I have to change about my mindset? What do I have to change about my training approach? Like I started just really looking inwardly and um, I'm so grateful for that. You know, I started reading like <laughs> every self-help book uh, I could find or now they're called self-improvement books. And, um, you know, it just, I really started looking inwardly and, um, you know, I think in sport, like we're, we're all often criticized. So it's important to have the voice that's inside your head when you make a mistake or you fail or whatever being on your side um, consistently. And so I really learned um, a lot about confidence. And I mean, it's been a process. I've had multiple setbacks since then. <laughs> I'm going through another one right now. But I just think, um, I think at the end of the day, like um, who you are um, is such an important part of football because that is something that does not change whether you're on the field or not. Um, so when you go to bed every night, you can always be proud. And I think I learned that um, in 2008. And so I will forever be grateful for that setback. Yeah, thanks, Aaron. Um, remember that 2008 game? Yeah. Oh, um, and that's an important thing to, to share. And we'll talk about it a little more that um, understanding of self that you speak of and, and overcoming obstacles because of your belief in yourself and your abilities. And uh, that that rolls nicely into Deanne, who actually got pulled up to the, the senior team very young. Um, I'd like to know what it was like getting your first call up to the national team. I'd like to know how nervous you were. And I'd also like to know how much the senior players, especially roommates at that time, made you feel comfortable <laughs> and part of the team. Yeah. <laughs> well I was coming into the national team I was like the shyest kid ever I was so nervous um I hadn't had any youth national team experience so I was like even more nervous and then um just coming into a team and having to be like roommates with older players like Rian that you know have certain ways that they like to have their room and like certain rules stuff like that you know I I it made me more nervous, but I think it was for the better to get that out early. And <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, I think it, it helped my experience. I think it, it helped me to um, grow into the team, become more comfortable and uh, actually really grateful for those moments that I had with some of the older players. Um, but yeah, it was, it was interesting coming into the national team at a young age because um, just the conversations are so much different with older players and you don't want to, you're worried about saying the wrong thing or, or fitting in the right way. Cause like, there's so much time at camp that's not on the field. Um, so that's more of the times that I was more nervous about because I didn't really want to make any, I didn't really know how the national team was, but now I know like everyone's so inviting and, and, um, welcoming. So I'm, I was lucky that way coming in as a young player. Thanks. I, I, I'd like to say that when you say rules, 
turning your phone off during the night. Okay, we, we don't have to call it. Yeah. Out. <laughs> okay. Cash it out. No. <laughs> Get her out of the way early was also a little bit harsh, but that's okay. Um, I think that was Robin laughing. that actually put us together. <laughs> so know, she's laughing right now for sure. <laughs> Um, thanks. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Aaron, you know, I'd, I'd love you to describe what a typical day for a professional athlete looks like. So this is a question that comes up a lot from young players. Uh, what do you have to do every single day? So I'd love to hear about what your day when you're not in quarantine looks like when you're preparing to be fit and ready for the national team. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, um, I think everybody is different. And, um, you know, when I was, younger it was all about like training as hard and as much as possible um, but I think um, I think now it's more about efficient and specialized training which I feel is a really awesome time in women's football because it's accelerating at such a wonderful pace but I think for me like um, obviously sleep is um, the best recovery there's nothing better than sleep so you know, I have my little like recovery band and I'm calculating my hours of sleep um, and then when I wake up I cannot live without coffee. That's a must. But um, I do a bit of meditation, um, which essentially for me is focus training. And I also do um, some mental training and then um, off to training, you know, doing rehab, prehab, um, injury prevention exercises um, before we even get into uh, a meeting before training of our meeting, sometimes it's tactical review or just kind of what the session plan is for the day. Getting through a training session um, and then having a meal right afterwards as a team um, and then getting into um, kind of like in the gym work, uh, more of a lift uh, and then potentially another meeting and then coming home. And some of us, like I said, uh, my recovery is actually my other full-time job. So I'm like in the recovery boots or Normatex, um, ice baths, um, you know, I get treatment as much as possible. Um, so, um, you know, and again, back to sleep and, and nutrition is so key. Um, so yeah, that's kind of a, I would say a typical, a typical day. Well, thanks, Erin. I think it's it's cool for the audience to hear a bit of insight on the off-field preparation um, and the you know the hours that actually goes into optimizing the work that takes place for maybe only one to two hours actually on the field. Um, we're going to shift gears a little bit, but before we do, Deanne, I just I don't know if this will make you feel better, but just so you know, Rian also has rules for veteran players as well, also staff members, <laughs> um, and. I'm going to say we're all more resilient for it. So we'll thank her for that. But That's uh, true. that is true. <laughs> we're, you know, this just gives a good segue into where we're heading into now, which is really going behind the scenes and diving into what it's really like to be a part of the Canadian women's national team. If you're already not starting to see a couple of hints here, but um, I'm going to start with you, Jordi on this call. You're the newest addition to the team, but you've already have 30 plus caps under your belt. Um, how would you describe being a member of Ken WNT? Um, I'd say that Deanne kind of summed it up previously. I feel like everyone's so welcoming and even from the beginning, it wasn't even, I wasn't even too nervous just because everyone was so welcoming and just, I showed up and felt like I was part of the team and I've been there for so long and I just meshed so well. Um, but of course, I mean, I think we're, a top-notch team so to be a part of it is always an honor and to wear the jersey and to get those 30 caps is incredible so yeah even though I am the newest I still have been there for a little bit but um yeah no excited to progress and keep getting more years and hopefully catch up to the rest of the team on the caps. Well, well you have time on your side there Jordy so <laughs> we all look forward to continuing to watch that but uh now, Jess, we'll go to you. Um, in many ways, you're, you're a veteran, which is strange because you're very young as well. Um, but can you tell us so far, um, what has been one of your favorite moments representing Canada? Um, I mean, it's pretty hard not to say the bronze in Rio. Um, I think that, I mean, the whole tournament um, and kind of, I think just how connected that group was, was uh, pretty special. Um, I mean, I could also cite uh, playing a World Cup at home or, or being a part of that experience was 
um, especially unique, just being able to feel so connected to Canadians. Um, like when you asked uh, Jordy what our environment is like, I think about it as a group of some pretty hardcore Canadians. So um, yeah, I, th I think being close to Canadian fans or anytime we get to play at home uh, is a lot of fun for me. Well, we talked a little bit about, you know, the schooling decision earlier. And one of the realities that all of us on this call have experienced at some point in our national team career has been balancing school and the travels and the commitments of representing both our schools and the national team. Aaron, I don't know if you still remember that time, but we've all been there. Um, Deanne, we're throwing this to you. So how do you balance being a student athlete for Florida, um, competing for Florida while also representing and competing for Canada? Um, wow, that picture. Um, I think what has helped me a lot is the people that I have surrounding me. I think I've always been blessed to have people that are prepared to um, work with me and, and give me the time that I need to complete certain things. So I think like when I'm at camp, it's just like scheduling time. And then when I'm, when I'm at school, it's just making sure that I take the first couple of weeks to really hone in on my homework and make sure I really get caught up and, and just do the things that I have to do so that I can get to normal time where I'm playing and, and doing school and not having to catch up. It's always always a balance for sure, um, and we are really lucky with the the senior women that those that are still in school are um, very serious about their academics, and you being one of them. Erin, uh, I was a little in I was very interested in what you were talking about when um, you were speaking about mental performance, about who you are, not changing the enjoyment of the game. I know you've been doing some work at the moment, starting a company on the mental side of the game. Can you talk a little bit about how you've brought that into how you play and how it affects maybe how you prepare for games? It's, it's a question that young people always ask, how do you handle your nerves? But it's maybe a bigger question, like how do you handle or how do you deal with trying to be present uh, with the mental side as well as the physical side? Um, okay, that was a big um, question. I um, So, the interesting thing about nerves is I've always been a really nervous player and the research that I'm able to do, I'm, I'm working with a professor, her name is Dr. Rachel Linval, and we've started the Mindful Project together and I'm learning a lot of really cool things that I wish that I knew like 15 years ago, but um, what I'm learning about stress and performance anxiety, however you want to call it, is um, it's actually our relationship with stress that matters. So if you get nervous before a game, stress is like not a bad thing. We all always think that stress is this like horrible thing and it's going to destroy us. But really, if you break stress down um, from an evolution standpoint, it's just our body preparing us for an event. That's all fight or flight, you know, like kill the tiger or run from the tiger. So um, yes, you're welcome for that example. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that's what it is. Your body is preparing you. So at the end of the day, if you ultimately believe that you're nervous because your body is just preparing you for a game, then that's all it is. And you start believing it's a positive thing. Whereas if you think it's going to, you know, it means that you're not ready or that um, you're not good enough, um, then that's what it will mean. So a lot of times it's like your relationship with these feelings. So that doesn't mean like now I don't get nervous for games or I don't feel the nerves, but instead I'm like, it's almost a relief now when I, when I feel nerves, cause I'm like, oh good, I'm just getting prepared. So learning a lot about that has been really interesting. And um, the other part is, is being present. I'm trying to answer every part of your question. <laughs> being, being present is really that space between thought. Um, and, you know, we call that the zone. That's why we meditate. It's a focus practice. Um, so that's something that I'm incorporating more and more um, into, you know, my practice, but just how I am all the time. So the zone is much more accessible to me. It's easier to shift into. And then finally, I think um, as far as like my mindset, what I realized that I was sitting with Alex, um, we were having a conversation um, about art because I'm really passionate about art. And, and, you know, I, like I told you, I was like, um, like self handicapping because of my fear of mistakes. And he asked me to talk about art and he was like, well, how do you, 
um, you know, like, how do you feel when you make a mistake in art? And I thought it was like, I was like, Alex, what is he talking about? I'm like, Alex, there's no mistakes in art. Like you either paint over it or you do something different. And sometimes like the mistake is the most beautiful part of the piece. And then I had this moment that I was like, holy crap. Like I am, I have a fixed mindset in certain parts of my life. So why don't I have a growth mindset in everything that I do? And so that kind of like epiphany um, started, you know, you know, you have to basically start from scratch at, you know, my age, it's not easy to do, but, and then you start kind of evaluating these mistakes in every area of your life. And like I said, like who you are on and off the field, like I want my mindset to be how I am, not just how I am as an athlete. Cool. Um, first, you're not a hundred years old, so stop it. Um, and yeah, your, your mindfulness work has, has been uh, fantastic and it's been cool following that. So thanks for sharing a little bit of it. And I love that art uh, reference. I think we can all probably learn a lot from that. Not the art part, but you know, whatever you do in your life. <laughs> um, so Jesse, I, I want to talk to you a little bit about joining the team. Like you actually were, were very young as well. And you've mentioned being, being shy and being quiet. So when you first joined the team, what was, how did you find your place? And did you feel like there was um, someone that sort of took you under their wing? Did you feel mentored at all? Or did you just have to try and figure out uh, where you fit in on your own? What was it like? Uh, yeah, I was definitely pretty quiet. I think some people would say I was mute for like the first two or three years on the team, but I take a while to open up to people. So that's not unusual, but um, no, I mean, kind of echoing Deanne, there were definitely a, a large handful of players who really, um, I mean, were extremely welcoming and, um, you know, kind of took me a little bit under their wing on the field, um, just in the midfield, like Desi, uh, D, I mean, Aaron, um, Rian, Robin, I, I mean, to be perfectly honest, everyone was um, very welcoming. And I think for me, you know, going into the national team, um, I was just trying to have an open mind and uh, be open to feedback and um, kind of just really, you know, learn from players who had been there for a while. So um, not to say it wasn't a uh, very scary experience at first and, and took a lot of getting used to, but um, I think those growing pains are, are kind of common in any new environment. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, the biggest thing for me was kind of just going into it with a, with a growth mindset, but I can't say enough about the people on the team and, and kind of the advice I was given. And I mean, even just training with players and being able to, to watch what other people do and learning from that. Um, I think a big, was a big part of my experience with the team early on. And I mean, even still today, um, kind of just learning from some of the stuff people do in, in training is, is pretty cool. Nice. There's probably not many more welcoming um, people than a Desi Scott in the middle who, uh, who definitely probably played a part in, in all of us uh, feeling at home in the team. So pretty special person to have with us. Um, so Jordy, I'm going to pass on to you now. So you've you said 30 caps, but according to Dom, you've got 33, just so you know. Um, I'd love this is a two prong question, but I'd like to know which is your favorite of those 33 caps, which was your favorite game. And a question that came in is who's your favorite opposition? Who do you most like to play against? Oh, OK, um, to answer the first one, I think there's two games that really stand out in my head. The first one would be. Um, my first and second goal at BMO, I feel like just getting those in front of a Canadian crowd was just incredible. The energy and you could just feel it. Um, so I definitely say that was my first one. And obviously um, the World Cup was incredible. Just the walkout. It's always been a dream of mine to play at a level like that. And um, growing up, I watched the World Cup and you kind of follow the cameraman down, down, like, down the tunnel and he shows the ball and the players and you walk out and um, to kind of be a part of that in a way was really, really cool. Um, so even just that walk out, that first part was incredible and be able to play it in front of my family and friends who came out to support. And um, yeah, that was definitely amazing. Um, and the second, the second question was my favorite opponent to play against. Um, it definitely have to be the U S I think there's such a, 
rivalry between us and them that I don't think you can really pick anyone else. Um, yeah, you just think about that game for days and days in advance. Um, and then you go out and just perform to your best abilities, of course. But yeah, it's just such a gritty game between them and us. And I feel like it's always so close. Um, and it's a game that you really want to rise up to. So I definitely pick them. Thanks, Jordy. Well, staying a bit on that theme of grit, uh, Deanne, um, Everyone in our environment, our environment, we strive to be gritty because we know that's something that's important. Um, how have you stayed motivated um, while managing challenges in your career so far? Um, I think for me, like a big, a big focus is mentally just like believing in myself. So I think just like trying to put attention to that confidence like no matter with injuries or anything like that I think just no matter where I am in my career I just try to always come back to like just coming back to my identity as a player and my identity as a person and then um yeah just using that as a base and kind of like a fuel to my fire yeah, I love what you said and just kind of as a follow-up you kind of touched on it there but how have those moments um like you said going back to your identity like how have you used those as opportunities to come back stronger um, I think it kind of touches on what Jesse was saying earlier about growing pains. Like, I think just like as a young player getting used to being in, in the environment and then switching between high school to college and, and then whatever I go on to do in the future, like I think it's just getting adjusted to different environments and, and those things come with that learning my body, learning how to play, learning stuff like that. So. Thanks, Deanne. So we're going to go to a couple of questions from the audience. Um, so the first one, and I'm going to give this to Aaron. Do you have any pre-match superstitions? Oh, I feel bad. This is going to be a boring answer. I don't, uh, I don't really, but I do try to listen to very relaxing music. I used to listen to like really like revved up music, but I was, I'm nervous before games. So then I would just be even more of a wreck. So that's like my only thing. I just like something that chills me out before a game. That could be like Louis Armstrong, like even classical music, but um, yeah, just chill. Okay. Thanks, Aaron. And I've gotten a couple of questions just texted to me from Diana Matheson. Um, the first one is for Jordy, and the question is, who do you think would win in a fight, Jordy or D? Jordy. <laughs> and like, I'd put out like that, and then she wouldn't be able to touch me. Um, <laughs> okay, you've already had that in your head, so I don't know what to think about that. Um, and then the second question from, um, from D, and I'm going to put this to Jesse and Deanne. Jesse, we'll start with you. Um, Diana wants to know what you guys have learned about leadership from being on the women's national team. Oh man, um, a lot. Um, I think the best way to think about it for me, uh, I think like over time, you know, Deanne talks a lot about this learning mindset. Uh, and I think, you know, since I've been on the national team, um, I've changed a lot uh, as a person and as a player. Um, so I think I'm kind of constantly, you know, like recreating myself in little tidbits um, and, you know, being surrounded by people like Sink and Dee and Aaron and, and Soph and Des and the list goes on. I think there's, you know, little bits that you kind of steal from all of them. So, I mean, I look at Sink and she's such a quiet leader and she kind of just goes about her work and I appreciate about that about her immensely. So. You know, I think I take a little bit of that from her. And then Desi is this super outspoken and passionate kind of hype woman. So um, I think she's kind of helped me find a little bit of my voice and become a bit more of a leader in the midfield. Um, and then I think about Dee and, you know, all the work she puts in, puts in off the field and, you know, how she kind of takes younger players under her wing and is um, just so passionate about the little details. Um, so I... I, I mean, I think there's little things I could take from, from everyone. Um, yeah, those are, those are a few things that come to my mind. Thanks, Jess. And Deanne, what about you? Um, I think for me, it's similar um, with all those different types of leaders that we have. I think what I've, the biggest thing that I've learned is like, there's no perfect type of leader. Like on the national team, we have so many different type of leaders and it just shows like everybody's a leader in their own way and it's just kind of about coming into your own shoes and and showing 
that you care for the team the same way that everyone else does. So I think like all the veterans that Jesse named and then plus like all the upcoming veterans, like we have like Kadisha, Ashley, Janine, Quinny, all of the um, the medium veteran, not new players anymore that are still super young. I think just looking at them, like they all bring something completely different in their own way. And like none of them is more or less of a leader than the other. So it just shows like, the younger players coming up that everybody contributes something and it's so important to have every single player be a leader you can't just rely on one leader to speak up or one leader to show lead by example it, it it's a team effort and and i think the best teams perform when everybody takes their role as a leader oh deanne love it guess he's going to be leading the next cultural connect oh gosh, okay yeah. <laughs> Um, no, both of you, I think you've highlighted some great points, and I think hopefully everyone listening, no matter what capacity you work in, whether it's in sport or outside of sport, it's really appreciating that no matter who you are, that your unique personality traits and your skill sets, you can lead and you can excel, but you got to learn to master from within who you truly are. So thank you both for highlighting that. And Dee, thank you for the question. I know you're listening. Um, so we're going to head into our final portion of this Connect. And for that, we want to know about how you guys have been navigating this interesting year. Um, what's next for Can WNT? And start to hear a little bit of advice you might have for players and coaches based on the various experiences you guys have had. So we'll start with COVID-19. We've all been learning this year to adapt with the unique reality, essentially daily. Um, Deanne, what has been a positive that you've taken out of this global pause? Well, I've had a lot of time to myself and a lot of time to think. And then I've also been blessed with time to work at these pictures. I can't. Anyways, um, the, I've been blessed with a lot of time to work on things that I haven't had the time to work on in the past. So I think, um, yeah, honestly, the best thing that's come out of this quarantine is just time. Like, and, and it's just how well you use it. And I've used it better than I thought I would. And I'm happy about that. So yeah. <laughs> How do you not like this picture? It's so nice. <laughs> oh, man. Um, Jesse, you said something really interesting, which was I've grown so much as a person and as a player. And I think what people don't realize is when you join the national team, it's at different times, but you actually spend your adult years together. You you evolve as a person the whole way through it. It's a really cool experience to look back and, and know that you've gone through all these life stages together. So it's a, a good reminder. I actually remember sitting with Deanne and I think I was talking about my mortgage and she was trying to pass high school math or something like definitely different life stages um, with players on the team. So this is, this is a, a bit tied into the question I want to ask and that is, is there some like interesting fact about the women's national team or something funny that you think people might want to know about the team or, or someone that plays for the team that you want to share? Um, the one thing that came to mind, and it, it kind of ties into the question about pregame rituals, but um, we always eat pancakes as our pregame meal. Uh, it's kind of a tradition that you don't mess with. Um, I can't remember which tournament it was, but it was actually messed with once um, so that we would, uh, you know, be ready for any sort of unknowns on game day. Uh, and they took away our pancakes on a game day. And I think everyone um, was pretty upset, but uh, they were trying to teach us a lesson about being able to adapt on game day, but don't mess with the pancakes. It, it didn't go over well with, uh, with the staff. I think it got a lot of complaints post camp. So uh, we love our pancakes pregame. I like how you said it didn't go down well with the staff. Like it, it, the players were annoyed, but I think a lot of the staff were like, the heck? <laughs> yeah, the staff, the staff always steal quite a few of the pancakes. Please eat to eat for too. everyone. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I love that. Thanks. I think uh, people are often surprised or that when they learn as well that you get a few uh, gummies after games. Uh, so the simple sugars to go quickly to your muscles. Uh, that's always something I look at young fans watching you guys on the field with your little baggie of, of weighed gummies. It's always a funny, funny moment. Um, Deanne, uh, a lot of young, uh, young people listening today. What advice uh, would you want to give to a young aspiring soccer player um, to help them achieve their goals and aspirations? Uh, 
Ooh. I think the best advice I could give, probably going off what I was saying before, is just believing your believing in yourself. And despite your setbacks and just surrounding yourself with the right people and the right things around you and, and just making sure that you believe that that confidence is what drives you. And it doesn't matter where you are right now, but just where you're going and what you're prepared to do to get there. I love it. You're talking about self and I, I don't know about you guys, but when I was young, it was really easy to compare myself all the time. Like they're doing it faster. They caught on faster, but believing in yourself and, uh, the confidence to, to keep pushing your own standards. I love that. So Jordi, you talked about watching World Cups on TV and then you talked about the incredible experience of, of walking out in France uh, last year. So what are your feelings about uh, the new host being named Australia and New Zealand? Yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, I've been to Australia, I think one time um, and it was so cold. It was like July and it was freezing. And I remember, like, um, we were doing warm-up, like, match day minus one, and we were just doing, like, a little acceleration before this final fun shooting game. And I, like, slipped, and I hit my head, and the ground was so hard that I got a concussion on the ground. And that's just classic Jordan. But um, I'm happy to be back and make new memories and hopefully better ones than that. Um, but, yeah, definitely excited. Um, makes it kind of more real once you have a vision of where it is and the location everything like that so yeah couldn't be more happy and just excited to kind of get there already I I had no idea that was classic Jordan um I think we're all a little bit alarmed right now and we're gonna help you with that going forward um so we're gonna switch gears a little bit here um so Jess this question's for you um knowing that uh, and you can give light to what it was but knowing that you did a couple of sports growing up but we're starting to see athletes specialize in one sport earlier and earlier in, in their athletic careers now. Um, what are your thoughts on multi-sport versus single sport athletes? Um, good question. Uh, so I grew up playing hockey, soccer, um, and I ran a lot uh, in high school. Um, and I, I definitely think it, it kind of contributed to the athlete I am today. Um, I actually grew up playing boys hockey um, boys contact hockey. So, uh, I kind of grew up in that like physical environment. And, um, I mean, I mean, for me, I think the value in, in playing as many sports as I could for as long as I could before it, um, uh, kind of just became too much scheduling wise. And, you know, my parents had to drive me everywhere. So, um, uh, I, I think it kind of just develops, like, I mean, I was in three different competitive environments. Uh, so I had different coaches in each of those environments with different perspectives. Um, and I mean, obviously cross country, uh, is very valuable for, uh, you know, soccer and especially in my position, um, I, I do a fair, fair amount of running. So, um, it's still something I try and maintain, um, in terms of, you know, my physical shape and it kind of ties into, to the view of, of sports as being holistic. So, um, you know, the strength aspect and the, the conditioning aspect are, are really important to me. And uh, I think playing other sports kind of contributed to, to myself as a whole player. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm really grateful that, um, you know, my parents put me in other sports and I was able to, to play them for a while. And I mean, I also have really good friends from uh, both running and hockey that I'm still close with today. Um, um, you know, that I look up to and I still train with. So I think that's another cool aspect. Thanks, Jess. Um, and Erin, you know, we see sometimes now a lot of girls are starting to drop out of soccer or sport in general during their teenage years. Earlier, you talked about overcoming um, some challenges or obstacles in your career, but was there ever a time when you didn't, you know, enjoy soccer and considered leaving the sport? And how did you refine your passion for the game. Hold on, part three. <laughs> what advice would you have for young girls or young athletes in general who may be going through this now? Ooh, okay. Um, so yeah, I have had multiple burnouts in my career. Um, never to the point where I wanted to like quit soccer altogether. Um, but I think just overdoing it. And um, I mean, there's so much more science now. Um, you know, because it's not quantity over quality. 
And that I think was a big shift. And I think a lot of, a lot of it is also pressures um, externally um, to kind of go back to what Jesse was saying. And, you know, the research that I'm reading now is, um, oh, cute, Molly. Um, we don't actually find out uh, on average, humans don't really know what they're passionate about until they're in the seventh grade. And even then it like, it's kind of like this slow development. So um, sometimes I'm not gonna throw all the parents under the bus here, but uh, sometimes I think there's pressure coming outside for us to specialize quite young. And I think that's where a lot of the dropout comes. Like it has to be um, internally driven. So I think kind of um, that's the first thing. Um, and I think also um, getting to know your body at a young age, like as an older athlete, you know, like you listen to your body a lot more because you have to, you can't like take as many risks. But I think if you can learn that as a young player, um, when to push yourself, when not to push yourself, knowing that if my folk, if I'm really focused, I'm going into a training session instead of like, oh, let's see how this training session goes. You know, like I want to work on my first touch or I want to work on like just having kind of more specific goals going into sessions, making it more about quality than quantity. I think um, that's something that I kind of, if I had to do over, I would, I would have done that. And I think the last part of your question, the advice I would give is that, okay. Um, I think what, if I could go over, my whole career again, I think just realizing that successful people make twice as many mistakes as people who are not as successful and how um, essential that is for growth and kind of understanding that and, and realizing that a mistake is actually such a vulnerable act. It's like pushing yourself to something you've never done before and kind of seeing the gold in that um, instead of seeing it as showing that I'm not perfect and that I'm that I have flaws, like, can you imagine me having flaws? Oh my God, um, you know what I mean? So I think just um, realizing that, and I'm, I'm not saying that it's, it's easy now, you know, I still have a hard time, but I have that moment where I catch myself and I, I start being like, if I'm not making mistakes, then I know that I'm getting comfortable. Um, so the last thing that I will lead you with, because Rian, I totally agree with what you said about comparing and I, and I still get caught up, but I read this really awesome quote, um, the other day about confidence and it says confidence comes from, um, focusing on what you can control. And, um, there's so many things around us, other people, um, you know, outcomes of games. There's a lot of things that we can't control, but like attitude and effort, there's certain things that are always within our control. And if we continue to put our time and energy into those things, I think that's where your confidence really will grow. Thank you. Very much. Sorry. That was lovely. Thank you to you and Jesse. Those are some great insights. And I even think some of those things I'm going to be putting towards my personal development plan professionally. So. Thank you both. Um, a lot of the questions that we've been asking today have been, you know, from players um, who are aspiring to be players in the national team or to be university player, pro players, but we also have coaches joining in and they're curious to know about if you guys can recall moments where a coach has made an impact on you either through mindset or training or just in general as a human being. So Deanne, this one's coming for you. Um, if you have a particular moment that stands out for you from a coaching experience and what qualities in general do you think in a coach helps bring out the best in players? Um, I had a coach from age about 10 to 13 who I think was really critical in my development as a player because I was a really shy kid and a shy player, and I wasn't the most vocal, um, and I didn't really know how to bring out my abilities to the best of my ability. So um, with this coach, he specifically helped me by just continuously showing me on a daily basis that he believed in me and that mistakes are okay and that the support was there. So I think um, as a coach, coaching any player, like I think that's one of the most important things it was for me, just knowing that the person coaching you has that belief in you that you sometimes don't have in yourself at a young age. Thanks, Dan. Um, good insight for some of our coaches listening. And before I hand over to Ree, and I'd just like to point out that you missed another opportunity because, you know, you do have one of your coaches on the line, but that's, that's okay. Anyways, Ree, and go ahead. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh my gosh. So the, the, the last little bit here, guys, I want to make sure we get a few questions that have been coming in. Um, so Deanne, you were just speaking. I'd, I'd love to hear you describe that um, 2016 Olympic goal you scored um, against Brazil in Brazil bronze medal game. Can you take us through it? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, well, we'll talk about the game first. Like, I know, like, well, the tournament, I was in the tournament. I played a role where I was kind of like a backup player, sub some games. Like I didn't really know how much playing time that I would get. And then, um, it came to the bronze medal game and I was starting. So I was super nervous, but I knew like there was a plan. I had fresh legs. Like it was time to execute the plan, like for the team. So um, during the game, I think we had a lot of dominance in the game because we were clearly the fresher team. Like we were down their throats, but we weren't really getting, I, I remember like Sink hit the crossbar on a, on a free kick or something like that. So we were, we were getting our opportunities and then, um, there was one counterattack where Ashley just bombed off down the line and me and Jesse were like <laughs> sprinting, trying to catch up to her. And then she played like the perfect ball that nobody could miss. And then, yeah, that was that. <laughs> yeah. Can I just say that Deanne started behind me and I was running as fast as I possibly could to get to the back post and she still managed to get there like four meters ahead of me. So, yeah. I especially liked nobody could miss. I bet you I could have. Um, <laughs> it was a, a pretty cool game. Um, on a personal note for me, I was I was watching. I was a finisher. And I, I turned into something from like Game of Thrones when that goal went in. Like <laughs> just went nuts. Um, but it was also a really cool moment for me as a player because our youth stepped onto the field and just dominated. Like the level of your play and. And Jess, I'd love to hear about goal number two. You were critical in that. What was that game like for you? You The ball came across from Ash, across in front of you, and then Deanne scored. But the second goal, uh, you played a huge part in. Can you tell us about it? Um, yeah, I mean, Brazil is always uh, a, a fun game, uh, a fun team to play. I think it's always super competitive. And uh, I think they were trying to play out of the back, and we got a bit of pressure on their fullback. Um, and then I think I... I got the ball and I think it was Deanne who made this sweet little run and I just tucked it to her and then she found sink and um, that was kind of it. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. It was very exciting. Yeah. I'm not I'm pretty sure there was a nutmeg in there, a little shimmy pass. So I, I was going to say, I remember like a nutmeg and like a couple more, like stealing the ball off someone a little bit more, but you know. Okay. It was, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, well, maybe we should have described it for you, and but uh, definitely a cool moment. And uh, you guys won us a second bronze medal, um, such a cool moment. And I'm sure definitely one that uh, players like Jordan, who are just coming through about to join the team, watched and must have been so inspired by. So, so cool. Uh, so Jordan, to you, um, I don't know if you remember watching that game, but actually have a more basic question. Someone wants to know who usually arrives late to training on this team who's the most consistently late to training what well, could be to meetings it's just someone who's usually late <laughs> last on the bus you know oh i feel oh, like come on. i feel like it's like different but like last on the bus or like last out of the locker room is usually dree it's usually like we all leave the locker room and then Maeve is like, is Dree out yet? Because if Dree's out, then everyone's out. So I feel like she's usually coming up at the end. Um, I feel like for meetings, sometimes it's like Keish, she's not late, but she just like casually saunters in around the end of the time. But I definitely say more so Dree. Uh, I think it might be a bit of Dree's superstition. Any Anyone else got anyone to add? Is Dree our winner? Ian looked nervous when you asked the yeah, question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that. Um, Aaron, as your name on here is E-Money, someone would like to know if there's, are there, are there any fun nicknames for players on the senior team? I think I think I have to pass this question on to other people on this um, 
call here because I, I mean, I don't really, I can't think of any, but I think you guys have a few. Jeffrey. <laughs> what did you say to you? The Jeffrey. Oh, Jeffrey. <laughs> Is that the end for the audience? They don't know. Jesse Fleming. Jeffrey Fleming. <laughs> Can you explain why? I don't know. I don't know. That's Jesse. Ask Jesse. You don't know the story? I do, but I don't I want you to explain it. <laughs> no, one practice, John had just spoken to Steph in front of the whole team, and he went to say Jesse, and instead he said Jeff. And then I think Melissa Tancredi thought it was hilarious, and it kind of stuck. <laughs> Weird how those things happen. Um, definitely, I don't think I've ever heard anyone call Christine Christine. I think that's a pretty safe one. Oh, except Robin. Um, yeah, there's always always lots of nicknames on the team, which is fun. So the last question, uh, just to, to wrap it up, I think this is a, a cool one uh, for you, Jeff. Um, who's a favorite midfielder that you like to play against, or maybe in world soccer, a player that is in your position who you just uh, really admire how they play? Oh, man, that's a tough one. I admire a lot of people. Um, I think one of my favorite teams and like midfield groups to play against is Brazil. Uh, I think there's always a lot to learn from the Brazilians. Obviously they're very good technically. Um, I'm a huge fan of Georgia Stanway on England. Uh, she's kind of younger. Kim Little was always one of my favorite players. Uh, she plays for Scotland. Um, I love the Japanese midfielders. Um, that's a lot of people, but um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think I'm just, I think something that all those players have in common is kind of just their willingness to get on the ball and um, I mean obviously they're spectacular players so there's lots of good midfielders in the world that's for sure. That's great I, th I think it's a, a testament to, to you but also to our team that yeah we just admire good good soccer and, and good players across the world so so thanks so the very very last thing Jordan can you say hi to Brooke please? Hi Brooke. <laughs> oh there we are good thanks. Um, We'd like to thank everyone for tuning in today and for the last eight weeks uh, for the Robin and Rian show. Uh, we, we should have named it that early on, Robin, but we're heading out now for some, um, some another type of R&R. &R. That's uh, Robin's joke, so I said it. It's been, it's been fantastic to introduce. <laughs> <laughs> it's, been really, it's been really nice to be able to talk about some of our, our structures and programs uh, to let people get to know the people that run them, the team behind the team, as well as to so many of our national team players. So a massive thank you to all the players and the staff um, who've allowed this to be possible. I'd uh, really like to thank Dom and Sandra from Canada Soccer who, who made this possible and have done a lot of work behind the scenes and uh, especially a huge thank you to Robin for joining me on this wild ride. These webinars have been, have been challenging and uh, hard to organize at times, but they've also been a lot of fun specifically because of Robin's energy and willingness to do most of the work. Mm -hmm. um, she's awesome. I love you, Robin. Thank you. And I really, I'm really, really appreciative that I get to speak last and I'm going to mute you because I also have the power. Um, and uh, as everything opens back up, oh my goodness, please put that up, Robin. As everything starts to open back up uh, around uh, Canada, but also around the world, uh, we hope you enjoy getting back on the field, uh, getting back to the game we all love, but please continue to stay safe and healthy. So thank you again to everyone for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.